Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here today. You know, in higher education and community colleges particularly, we are in a changed reality. We are in a changed reality. And that reality masquerades as issues such as transparency or it masquerades as discussion about outcomes. It masquerades as formula-based funding for community colleges. It masquerades as new strategies for accreditation standards. It masquerades as increasing levels of employer concerns about what students know and what they don't know. There's a clear and clarion call for a new currency in higher education, one that ignores grade level, one that ignores grade awards, and instead is built around what a student knows, understanding that that is evolutionary. So once these, these skill sets, these skill sets, once they are known, it's not done. It's not a one-off and we move on. That they are in fact a requirement that we have an ongoing and continuous conversation with industry-led credentials of market value. And that is an important part of our work. We, uh, we understand that uh, this work is important and it is urgent. And uh, we have found that it is not necessarily new to us from the standpoint that we have been around this business for a while, particularly as it relates to secondary program accreditation groups. In LNAC, for example, in relation to nursing, we've been demonstrating this through clinicals, for example, about whether you know something or not. One of the one of the challenges I think we face overall is how do we how do we catalog this? What is the new credential of market value? It is standing registrars on their heads trying to figure out what this looked like. How does this fit in? How do these things transfer? What do the employers really want? Well, we know increasingly employers are concerned about what pieces of paper are before them. In fact, I would say that the high school diploma is in question by employers, and actually grades are in question by employers. Notions of grade inflation, conversations such as that we've heard for a while. But we have an opportunity to create industry-led credentials that make sense to them in a language, in a parlance, which makes sense for them, that lead to stackable credentials of market value, stackable credentials of market value, particularly as it relates for community colleges to those middle skills jobs that are out there in such in, in high demand. Um, I'm glad to see that Dr. Bumfus is here from AACC. He has been leading a, a multi-year initiative relating to the 21st century uh, report, which will be coming out next April, announced at the AACC uh, annual convention which will be announced here in DC and I think you're going to see this work expressed uh, in large measure in that work. Today we have a, a number of folks with us to talk about how it's happening at the local level and uh, uh, here with me today online is Jerry Lee Moisure from um, Ivy Tech Community College. Uh, we also have Linda Howdyshell from uh, the, uh, Broward College, so we're glad to have you here, and as was mentioned by Amy before, Mary Alice is here also, so thank you all for being here. I prepared a number of questions that I want them to react to, so as a, as a way to give you a sense of how it's happening on the ground level, this, this evolution that is taking place. So uh, as perhaps a way of uh, introducing each of our, our panelists, and um, I, I think maybe setting the context for the discussion, I'd like each of our panelists to talk about the current situation at their college. What, what is the current set of environs that, that have uh, prompted themselves, the, the context, the, the organization, the leadership? What is happening that has created the context for a discussion around competency-based education to occur? Because, and this is important, because this seems, this seems so antithetical to the way that it's always been, the way we've always done things before. It creates interesting conversations with faculty when you say grades don't matter. Time doesn't matter anymore. We're talking about specific skill sets for individuals and demonstrable ability for that and how we quantify that. So it creates interesting conversations. So it's important to understand what happened on these individual campuses to allow and create the framing for this to happen. So maybe Linda will begin with you first and give us a little bit of context about what led up to the decision to move toward competency-based education. Thank you. Uh, at Broward College, 
uh, we were looking at our IT program uh, through our annual program review. And what we knew is that we had very few graduates in the BS program. And when asked, the instructors would say, well, they just come and take a class, uh, and then they get what they want. Because of that, we were very excited to join a consortium and receive a labor grant to develop com uh, competency-based education for the IT program. Uh, we sold it not by talking about how different it was, but instead talking about this is really what we've been doing. We've been assessing student learning outcomes, and this is just an extension of that. Uh, we, had a very, we knew that we could not uh, move this uh, from the top of the organization. We needed to have the AD, or the middle administrator, associate dean in our language, uh, actually buy in. And we were very fortunate to have a well-respected associate dean say, yes, I'd like to do this. Uh, I would say that he might be more authoritarian than we might want at times. <laughs> but for this particular initiative, it worked. He, uh, ha he asked for volunteers from his faculty, and all of it was volunteer work. He divided them into teams, and uh, we began with wonderful training for all the faculty from Western Governors. They had a developed model, so we weren't starting with whole cloth. We weren't starting uh, without a model. And so because of the training and because we had good leadership, supported at the executive level, we've been able to move this ahead. Is that enough? Excellent, okay. excellent, great setup. Maybe we'll jump uh, to, the, um, to the, the, the spaces over our head and the speakers here with uh, Jerry Lee. Are you still online? Yes, I am. Thanks, Dan. All right. All right, Jerry Lee, why don't you give us the same kind of contextual setup, if you would, for uh, what's happening out at Ivy Tech, please. Certainly. Um, Ivy Tech, as a singly accredited community college, um, embraced the Lumina Big Goal several years ago. But in addition to that, Ivy Tech Northeast, in working with our economic development partners in the Northeast Indiana Regional Partnership, also was embracing the big goal of 60% of our citizenry holding an advanced degree certificate or industry certification by 2025. This particular um, embracing of this big goal really made us recognize that we needed to do things a little differently than the way we've been doing them. And so when we received the call from um, really Sally to work with WGU in uh, the Gates Grant to identify one of our IT programs in, and working in competency-based education, it seemed as though that this would be a great start with working with some of our quality faculty and our administration to move us forward in doing things differently in order to address the big goal initiative. So consequently, we are as the second largest region of Ivy Tech in working with the Lafayette region um, as two of the 14 regions in the statewide institution. We are the two that are working towards this end and identifying how we work as a region or as a statewide institution in adopting competency-based education in the certificate that we'll begin adopt, uh, providing in January of 2014. Excellent, excellent. So thank you, thank you. And Mary Ellis, you really, I'm really glad you're here because you provide a unique perspective uh, with your experience at the Department of Ed and now here at the New America Foundation especially your work with regard to the TAC grants, as Eric was alluding to earlier. So I think you, you have the, the ability to give us some unique insight into what you're seeing among the community colleges and the, 
the, the process that is currently ongoing and what their vision is for the future based on what you've seen, if you want to share those thoughts with us. Sure. I, I'd love to, Dan. I'd also like, like to address just a minute this, this question of what are the, uh, the, the, the forces sort of leading to so much interest in, com in competency-based models, but think of it more from a federal level, and then what are the hopes of, of getting that out of it? Because I can't speak quite as much from an institutional mm -hmm. level, sure. but having worked both in the Department of Labor and in, in the Department of Education, I do think that this overarching context of the, you know, just awareness, um, uh, sort of beginning with the with the recession that has just become so so clear of the need for to for post secondary credentials on the part of of, of all adults in order to have a viable um, and to be able to make a viable living and, and gain economic self sufficiency was something that the Department of Labor and the Department of Education were both grappling with. Um, the data was just so overwhelming on this part on this point, and also the reality that so many adults were pushed out of work during the recession and needed to find opportunities to uh, rapidly recredential and reskill. So at the Department of Labor, we saw the department develop a high priority performance goal of increasing credential attainment by 10 percent of all uh, of all of their participants and their programs, which, which was a real acknowledgement that, that there was a need to make people's skills visible and make people's competencies visible. And then at the Department of Education, you had another goal set by the president, which was the 2020 goal of increasing the number of individuals holding post-secondary credentials. So you can see there's this overlapping need to make people's skills vi visible, what they can do, and that's why I think increasingly the departments found themselves talking about competencies and, and finding a shared language around competencies. And that really came together in the TACT grants then. And so the TACT grants were an opportunity to build the capacity of community colleges to deliver services to these adult learners who may already have a lot of work experience but just simply lack credentials. So that's what we saw is in the applications coming in, the first round, the second round, there was just so much emphasis on sort of on stackable credentials, on prior learning assessment, on helping people who already had skills get credit for them, and helping people who already had a lot of knowledge and experience accelerate their path towards a, a degree. So there are a lot, well, I mean, I think the other folks have already talked about the institutions that are doing this well, and I think um, it sort of reflects this larger context uh, uh, that is hopefully supporting these developments at the local level. Excellent, great insight, thank you. Um, generally, maybe we'll start with you. I wish you could. I wish you could see this. We've got a chair for you. We've got a microphone. We've got a name tag for you. It's it's pretty cool. <laughs> so you're here Wonderful. virtually. Um, let me move on to the next question. Some of the realities, as the uh, session is called here, this uh, this portion on our agenda is talk about building these models on our campus. There are some practical realities that many of our colleagues need to get a handle on, and those realities relate to the discussion. They relate to the conversation with faculty. With, uh, with industry leaders. They, they are conversations with our, uh, with our registrars, with our student services people, with our counselors and advisors and transfer organizations. In some ways, this conversation is familiar, but for, for some, it is really adjunct and it is disruptive. Can you talk about how you've, you've begun this conversation on your campus and how you've dealt with this? How, what kind of reactions have you had from these various groups? Certainly. Uh Really, I think as most leaders know, when you start innovation, and it's all usually innovation is local, the selection of the right people to get started um, is a key critical factor. And so in talking with WGU in the beginning of the grant, we identified basically one faculty member who was a, a program chair in our computer information systems, who had a wide history with the college, but also had a lot of respect by her colleagues throughout the institution, of the state institution. So Dr. John Easy, on um, selecting her, selecting, having her select the courses, the certificates, and work in collaboration with Paul Addison at Lafayette, they really drove the development of the coursework. But they needed administrative support, and Dr. Kathy Maxwell, who is our Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, provided really that administrative support and guidance regarding how implementation might work most effectively within our structure. Um, we really probably missed a step or two in the very beginning, in creating the dialogue with our financial aid folks with our registrar and working through some of the systemic issues of support 
around the certificate. So we did some really quick catch up uh, over the last couple months in order to make sure that that certificate would be offered in January. So I would recommend to folks really understand the implications throughout the system, um, as Janet had indicated, with your student services personnel, with, with your accrediting body, and having that communication with your accrediting body early on that you're working at changing some of the way you deliver the courses. It's not so much, it's not direct assessment, at this point, but it is the way in which you're delivering and just communicating that back to the accrediting bodies. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is some confusion, at least with a lot of institution, about what exactly and how it's delivering. So we've spent a quite a bit of time uh, over the last month or so really communicating. And uh, that we could have done that earlier, and it would have been much smoother as we look towards our implementation date. Great. Great. Thank you, Jerry. How about you, Linda? What are your thoughts? Well, I think the easiest way to answer the question would be to list some of the uh, places where we had to, uh, well, we had resistance or difficulties. The first was with faculty who thought of this as a commercial model. Anything that would take away from the traditional uh, college uh, program they thought of was perhaps cheapening or making it less than. So we had to make sure that they felt indeed that this was just a different uh, form of education. It met different students' needs and it allowed for more diversity in our student body. Uh, the rigidity of our standard semesters and terms uh, was a, is a real problem. Everybody needs to start at the same time and they need to end at the same time. And so we needed to figure out a way, and it currently it's a manual way, of allowing students to take more than uh, one course in a term or a semester, being able to finish earlier and receive a grade. Uh, and in the 20 students we have enrolled since August, uh, we have at least two students who have completed two courses already, and we aren't even at the end of the full semester. So, as I said, it's manual currently. To make this uh, full-blown, we're going to have to have a different uh, system for that. Uh, grading and transcripts was a real concern. Uh, how, as, uh, as Sally mentioned earlier, students need to be able to transfer. They need to have a transcript that indicates what, they, what they've actually learned. Uh, at Broward, we've decided that a S, a satisfactory, is a B, 87%. And if they do not achieve that level, they do not pass or complete the competency. Again, this is a manual process. Uh, accreditation was a concern. Uh, I know that in our accreditation area, uh, Dr. Whelan is here, and she's convened several, at least uh, a couple meetings and committees to discuss competency-based education, and I know that we'll be able to work that through because of their emphasis on student learning outcomes. Financial aid, uh, we were very fortunate uh, to be able to work through the financial aid issues without as much difficulty as we thought, because financial aid is always thrown up as the stop. Oh, can't do that financial aid, can't do that financial aid. But we found that we were able to do that. And the final thing was suitability uh, for the student body. Uh, not, this is not right for every student. Uh, there are students, perhaps the ones straight out of high school, who need to have more structure, need to have face-to-face, -face, need the, more of a cohort model, but uh, it is a wonderful model for students who uh, want to accelerate their learning, who have prior knowledge, who uh, want to enter at any point in a term, uh, because adults don't know they need the education exactly on August 19th. They may get laid off in uh, September and need to start a program in November. This allows that to happen. Those are, those are great insights at, at my own institution. We're, we're facing some very similar kinds of things. Um, and in fact, uh, one, of the, one of the rallying cries among some of our faculty is that I'm trying to remake our institution into a Western Governor's University. 
And I thought, well, what's wrong with that? <laughs> uh, truly, I, th I think what the, all kidding aside, I think that the, the biggest issue is that the speed at which change is occurring is, is really troublesome for people who have had stability. Um, higher education abhors change. Um, only wet babies like change. Everybody else, not so much. And so uh, from, from our perspective, I think it is absolutely important, and I think what we're hearing among our colleagues here is that we have to recognize the fact that these are real fears that our faculty and staff have. And they present themselves as stress. They present themselves in lots of physiological ways. But they can also present themselves as potential barriers, financial aid, and, uh, accreditation, uh, things that are put up to stop the process. What is clear and what I'm hearing from, from Jerry Lee and Linda uh, and my own recognition of our institution is that these fears are real and they must be addressed. And so to that degree, we must at the front end involve not only industry leaders, but we also must engage as partners, our faculty, into the creation of this work. And that may take some time, and that's not a commodity that we have a whole lot of. So we need to get about this business, I think, pretty quickly, but also realizing that we need their input and understanding and support, and we need to hear their objection and concerns and try to allay those. I think also at risk, and I, I think that uh, uh, WGU has been a phenomenal leader in this regard, is that the notion of what is a faculty member is, is changing by itself with WGU. There are actually a, a, a disaggregation, if you will, of what have been traditional responsibilities of faculty and having that notion of discussion and, and what constitutes a faculty load and how am I going to get paid. It is interesting that the Carnegie unit is up, up for debate right now. If you look back to the true origins of it, it was how faculty were going to get paid. And it is interesting that we've kind of come full circle on that discussion about what, what are the responsibilities of faculty. And perhaps we think about that differently. So uh, we're all trying to move through this space uh, together. And uh, I, I guess I'm interested in, in hearing from all of, our, uh, all of our speakers, and maybe Mary Alice will start off with you, in, in recognizing that there are challenges aplenty out there as we move to fundamentally disrupt and create this innovation uh, across our institutions. Um, I'm wondering what, uh, what advice you talked about grappling earlier. What advice would you give our colleagues in dealing with these challenges? What, what suggestions would you offer them on a go-forward basis? Well, there's a couple things come to mind. I think um, the first is, is, is one that Linda already mentioned, which is, you know, competency-based education isn't necessarily for everyone. So, it, you know, I think there's some, sometimes you hear fear that the entire institution is then going to adopt one model and one approach to doing education and that, that it's not going, you know, it's going to take over, it's going to replace everything that's there. And it's, it's, instead of thinking about um, having multiple modalities on campus, multiple models that meet the needs of different students. And that that's a way then to make, again, the, the institution a place of just a lot of creativity and experimentation. And so I do think thinking about competency-based and being able to engage faculty and engage administrators in the degree to which it creates opportunity to better meet the needs of just an incredibly and growingly diverse group of students is, is a way to do it. And I would add to that that I do think that the department's recent letter on direct assessment that outlines, that cl clarifies, you know, how institutions can, can gain that authority and, and how they might work with their accreditors to do that is still uh, something that there's a lot of experimentation to be done in that area. Um, I think uh, the opportunities to work with employers in a much more engaged fashion and to develop models in which assessment is taking place at the workplace and informal learning is being credentialed opens up whole new opportunities. So I do think that it, to the degree that institutions can see this as an opportunity to not, not to, to, to replace their current model, but to build and expand on it and provide more opportunities and more, more modalities that work for more students, hopefully the more uh, we can um, sort of engage the entire community. The other thing I would say, too, is that one of the pieces of feedback that I think is coming from the TACT grants and that I always hear whenever I talk to uh, institutions doing competency-based education is the importance of the role of mentors and coaches. 
And again, I think this is a new and exciting way that we're learning about how to help people learn isn't necessarily what we always thought it was. And that there may be even more, thanks to the technology and the ability to reach many students, there may be ways to really effectively coach and mentor students in a cost-effective way that, again, works for everyone, the institution, the students, et cetera. Thank you. Linda, your thoughts? Uh, one of the things that we grapple with is, and it's been, re you mentioned it also, is we're a unionized college. And certainly uh, adhering to the union contract and their definitions of load and how people are paid and how much they can work and all of those things has been a major issue for us. Fortunately, because of the grant, we've not had too much problems. But uh, without that incentive, I think we would have had difficulty with that. Okay. Jerry Lee, how about you? Your thoughts on, uh, on grappling with this? Certainly. I, I couldn't agree more that it's not a one-size-fits-all. You know, it really is just one methodology in order to address student learning and to address the, really the needs that our employers are telling us that they require regarding the future workforce. And that engagement of the employers is absolutely critical in helping to define what those competencies may be. And so, and I, whether it's competency-based education or um, whether it is in other programs that we're going to be offering, that engagement of our employers is going to help us validate what we're teaching our students as they proceed throughout their educational career. And so whether we do it in competency-based education, which I think is a very valid delivery model that really validates what the students are learning, or whether we work in another delivery model, it's, it's how we can really fluctuate and adapt more quickly to what those demands might be. And sometimes large institutions and large um, and the regulations that surround those the processes make it, makes it more difficult for us to adapt. And so we've just got to be cognizant of that fact and make sure that everyone recognizes that that's our role and function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nicely said. Thank you. Um, maybe a, a final question for all of our panelists uh, prior to the uh, question and answer section. And I think, uh, Mary Alice, you've got a unique position for this, and that is um, your, your thoughts, general final co comments you want to make. but. Um, even more particularly, where do you think this is going? I mean, we're, we're kind of on the leading edge, some would say bleeding edge of, of this work. Uh, where do you think we're going from here? Well, gosh, I wish I had a crystal ball. So <laughs> that's, that's a, yeah, I'm trying to avoid predictions at all costs. But uh, um, no, but I would say I think we're moving in exciting directions and in a direction that I'm particularly excited about just because of uh, my interest in sort of better connecting uh, post-secondary education, higher education with what's happening in the labor market is that competency-based education is a space where employers and institutions of higher education can meet, where the public workforce system it can also be a partner. It's a space that I think speaks to a wider variety of partners. So I think what we can hope to see in particular is competency-based education being a strategy to help rationalize our credentialing systems so that people who learn things at work, and we all learn lots of things at work, can use those things to leverage their movement toward an academic degree and that they can move seamlessly in between work and school and work and school and make their skills constantly visible. Right now, these two credentialing systems, certifications and industry-based certificates, live in one world, while academic degrees live in an, and certificates live in another world. Increasingly, competency-based education is a place where the institutions of higher education become open to new kinds of partnerships and can work with different credentialing systems to create currencies that move back and forth. Okay, so. great. Uh, Linda, let me maybe uh, direct a little bit more for you and, and ask you as you w offer your final co comments if you would also maybe react to the notion that this is just a pendulum swing. It's, it's, it's shoving everything into competency-based education. We're focused on business and industry, and certainly higher education has to be bigger than that. Are you concerned about that on a go-forward basis? Uh, no, I'm not concerned about that. I have heard that argument. Uh, in fact, I often think about uh, the leaders in this movement as needing to be change whisperers. 
What I found is that when we announce that it's a big change and we're going to do competency-based instruction, people go, oh, no, no, no. But when you talk about working with employers, when you talk about uh, defining skills, making sure that across the uh, continuum of faculty, all students have the same level of support and have the same assessments, uh, they're very supportive. It's when we talk about it as a big change, they get really scared because they worry about their jobs and uh, what they've been doing for their entire careers. Jerry Lee, in offering your final thoughts, I thought maybe you would uh, address this question as well, and that is competency-based education works really well for, for these kinds of mechanical processes. The arts and the humanities, they don't lend themselves to this very, very well. It's kind of like defining love. You know it when you see it, when you feel it. Uh, so, so what thoughts do you have on a go-forward basis about arts and humanities, the, the higher things that we look to, how do we codify those and put those into tidy little boxes on credentials and transcripts? Uh, you know, Dan, I wish I could answer that. Um, I'm not sure because I'm not a subject matter expert in one of those areas. But I do think that the faculty who work in the arts and humanities could, um, coming together, define ways and competencies that they believe that those students should have upon completion of coursework. Because they do that now with their learning objectives of what they want students to know. So if we can define and measure and assess that within a, a competency-based model, I think that it is possible. But I would leave that up to the faculty who are working in the area in order to drive that particular initiative. Very good. Well, thank you, Jerry Lee. I know we've got a few moments here uh, to offer. I know we're standing between uh, this panel and uh, coffee break, so maybe that will expedite questions. We'll offer, uh, we'll receive any questions you have. Yes, please. And, and that is for many of us in community colleges, the place that we have addressed some of these challenges already is remediation because that's where we have put in accelerated learning programs and we've had to address the time issue, the registration issue, the financial aid issue. So we, we can actually show faculty in some of these areas, look, we did it, it was hard, um, it was very challenging, but it's there and it's on our campuses already and it's working and students are successful at it. Mm -hmm. So that's one way to, uh, We've already done the whispering, now we can do the <laughs> shouting and the hoorays. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Dorothy Wax, I'm with Kale. Hello. And um, I have a question about how, you, you've talked a lot about the faculty and, and uh, some of the administration, but how has competency-based education changed the advising process at your colleges? Mm -hmm. Linda, do you want to share that one? Well, we have moved uh, the advisors for this program into the program so that if a student wants to go into this particular program, which is uh, computer systems technician and analyst, uh, their advisor is right in the program. And faculty have also picked up the role of advisors. We're not saying, well, you're faculty and this is an advisor. They do both of those things. Jerry, Lee, any other thoughts on your end? No, we, we are just beginning with, with the advising component of students. And so obviously we've informed them about some of the um, basic requirements that we have for students, but we can be able to tell you more information after we move through this next semester. Yes, go right ahead. One other comment about the advising. Every student that we've admitted into this program meets with an advisor who discusses everything about the program prior to being admitted. So it's not just, I can sign up for it. Next question, yes, in the back. Thank you, Fred Winter, with the Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Education. Um, Thank you, Dan Phelan, for the, the wonderful analogy about the diaper. Um, I will <laughs> trade with one from my old former provost um, that in dealing with faculty engagement and preparation, um, there is no dead wood, there's only kindling. 
<laughs> in that context, my question for the panel, um, are you adopting or finding a need for different strategies in faculty preparation and engagement when working with contingent and adjunct faculty as opposed to full-time faculty? Jerry Lee, do you want to try that one? Well, I know we've done some training. Um, Joan Heise, again, as program chair, has done a lot of information to the adjunct faculty working with her program and has worked with Paul Addison at Lafayette. So that all of that is in the works. But since we are not beginning this particular our program until January, we're anticipating that Joan and Paul will be the initial faculty members as full-time faculty members. And as what they learn will then be transmitted through adjunct professional development opportunities through this next semester. Okay. Excellent. Linda, any other thoughts? Ours is the same way that we're using full time faculty on uh, overload. Uh, that's how they're uh, doing the teaching. And they have been in all the trainings that Western governors have provided. I would just add, I, I was recently out at Western Governors learning about their program and their unbundled faculty model and found it very interesting that there is a course faculty member and a student faculty mentor, a course mentor and a student mentor. So this unbundled model does seem to require a very different approach to training faculty and what their, what their specific uh, capabilities and qualifications are, and I think it's a, a great question. Clearly, a higher attention to professional development is absolutely essential yeah. being on the front end of this, absolutely. There was a question here, yes. I'm Kay Gilcher with the Department of Education. Um, my question has to do with the, the um, learning resources. What, uh, what are you using as learning resources? Are you indeed using uh, those that are not external to your institution? And what percentages of them are you incorporating? Our faculty have developed 11 courses. And they view, they've looked at external. Uh, resources, but they've also developed on their own and are developing actual labs for students to work through, uh, you know, simulate the kind of work that they're doing in being a computer tech or a, a systems analyst. Uh, so my answer would be we're using everything that we can find and we're developing what isn't there. I, I would echo what Linda is saying as well. Our experience is the, pretty much the same. Uh, in many cases, we're actually plowing this ground afresh by virtue of working with industry professionals and defining what those are. In some cases, we have post-secondary accreditors out there with a clearly defined set of competencies that they must have in order to sit for state boards, for example. So we're able to catalyze those as well as um, conversations from our from our employing community about specifically what they're looking for uh, and some of this we're, we're developing on the on the front end Jerry Lee did you have thoughts about your experience there about resources no I would I would also echo that we're using everything available and developing those um, items that we believe will best do the students and the competencies that have been identified so they've done a, a yeoman's job of really developing a whole plethora of resources that students can call upon. Very good. Well, I, I know we're out of time to keep us on schedule here. I, I want to extend my thanks to our panelists here today and also to ACE and Western Governors and AACC and the New America Foundation here for uh, making this uh, possible to begin the conversation. Thank you so very much. Thank you.